turn the group so here we can see we have got the groups so we want those groups re being returned in asp.net you can secure a controller so only authenticated users can access it by decorating it the method with the authorized attribute so this attribute also supports securing the endpoint based on a security group so after configuring the open id connect middleware to use microsoft identity as a role claim you can specify the id of a group to secure the controller so here and then you can also use the group information in the code using the user dot is in role method so for example this code here will only show the products navigation link if the user is in this specific group in this demo we'll see how we can utilize security groups in custom apps and api secured with microsoft identity so for this demo i have done some pre-work there's an application that i have created so in my azure active directory if i go to app registrations here i have got so let me just close this this one application user group role so i'm going to make use of this particular application here and for this application in the authentication i have got the web url and i have got this redirect url here sign in hyphen oidc and i have also enabled id tokens for this particular application now we are going to make use of a asp.net web application which also i have created here so this is my web application that i have got created and i'm going to run this web application first to show you what it is so let's go here and i'm going to say .net run and this application is running so I'm going to go here and let's open up localhost. So I need to sign in here. And this application signs me and it's showing me some of the claims. Okay. And if I go back to my code in my app settings.json file here, I have entered the client ID, the tenant ID, the callback path, which is what will be used by the application for the authentication. So this is the initial part that I have got for this demo. Now the next part we have is we are going to update the application registration in Azure Active Directory. So let me stop this application and I'm going to go back to let me sign out from here. Just close it. I'm going to go back to my application user group role. And what we are going to do is we are going to update the manifest file because we want to add certain groups. So I'm going to go here to manifest. And then here we are going to look at these group membership claims. So we want to update this to include security group here. So let me add a security group. Okay. And then next within this editor, I want to update the optional claims. So let's scroll down here. And here you can see we have the optional claims. So I want to update this. I'm going to replace this bit with these claims here. Okay, so let's okay so those are the claims and this one here also sorry so add this here okay so we have got that now let's save this So we have saved the manifest. Now we need to extend the application with 
authorization. So the home controller of the application contains authorized attribute, which allows any logged in user to view the page. Now, a new controller will demonstrate uh, using of group claims to authorize the user here. So here, the next step would be to add a model controller and a view to the web app that will display the products from this product catalog. So let's um, add this. Now, before we actually update the code, we need to first create a product viewer group. So let's go back to Azure AD and then I'm going to go here in the groups and then here we will create a new group i actually have one so we can make use of that so here i have got this product viewers group and the membership type is assigned and i have got an owner and then there are some members in here so me and megan we are the members okay so we have got the group here now what i need is i need the groups object id so let me copy this and I'm going to keep that in a notepad. So here I've got the object ID copied in in my notepad. Now next we will update the code. So let's go to Visual Studio and then here we want to add the code. So let me close these things. Now I want to go to models and here I want to add a new file and I want to call it category dot cs and i am going to add this code here so this is category id and name we want and then i want to also add a new file and i'm going to call this product dot cs and i'm gonna add this code in here for the product so we need the id name and the category for the product here and then we want to make sure that we have got the sample data so we are going to add a package for the sample data so let's say dot net add package and i'm going to create a new file again for the sample data. So let's call it sample data.cs. And I have got some sample data here. So let's keep that. Now we want to update our startup.cs like we did earlier. So we want to come here and we want to add the um, sample data initializer so here at this line let's add it. okay now we want to add a controller and view for the product so for that what i'm going to do is i'm going to go to this controllers folder and we will add a file and we'll call it product controller.cs and then have our code here so this is our product controller now here we want to replace this string with the group object id which is the value that we have copied from the group so this one so let's take that and then add it here okay now we create a view to display the product so we want to add a new folder products to the views folder so here we have got views now here i want to add a new folder for products and then in this i want to add a new file and we'll call it index.cshtml okay and then here we have got that so we have got this file for products view so this is our um, index.cshtml file okay 
So the ASP.NET identity system, it allows for an imperative test of membership via the user dot is in role method. So we use this method to update the site navigation following a link to the products controller only if the user is allowed to access it. So we want to then open views and then we have got here shared views and then we have got the underscore layout.cshtml. So in the header element, we are going to add some new code. So we are going to add here. So let me minimize this and then we will add here some code to say okay so if the user in this particular object id group object id then we want to show this so for that i am going to again copy our object id and then keep it here let's put it here and then save okay so now we are going to build and test the web application and see if we can see that product okay so let's go to our command prompt i want to run build And then we'll run it. Okay, so we uh, have got the application running. Now let's go to the browser and let's open up again. So first of all, I need to sign out and sign in again because it's loading from the cache. So let's go here. So you can see here that I have got these products because I am one of the users who is in that group. Okay, so I am able to see that. Now, what we can do is we can sign out and then I'm gonna launch this in, in private window and we'll log in with another user. So let's again go to localhost and then I'm gonna say let me actually get a user from here so let's go to here and let's pick up another user okay let's pick up alex copy So here we have to accept. Now Alex is not in the group. It's only me and Megan who are in the group. So now you can see that Alex is not really seeing that product because he's not in the group. So he's not seeing that option. Only I am seeing it. And if we log in as Megan, we'll also see that option there because Megan is part of that group here. So this is how you can utilize your security groups in your custom apps and APIs, which are secured with Microsoft identity. Next, we will look at leverage application roles in custom applications. So application roles are used to assign permissions to users and apps. These roles are defined in the registered Azure AD apps manifest. In this lesson, we learn how to add app roles to an Azure AD registered app, grant users and groups to the role and then use the app role within a custom app secured with Microsoft identity. So RBAC, it enables your administrators to grant permission to the roles versus the individuals and the groups here. So using RBAC with the application roles and the role claims, developers can securely enforce authorization 
in their apps with little effort on their part. So these application roles, they are defined in the Azure AD Admin Center in Applications Registration Manifest. So when a user signs into the application, Azure AD emits the roles claim for each user that the user has been granted individually and from their group ownership or membership. Assignment of users and groups to roles can be done through the portal UI or maybe programmatically using Microsoft Graph. The app roles can be managed from Azure AD Admin Center. So we need to select an application in Azure AD Admin Center. The roles are defined in Apps Manifest that is accessible from the Manifest navigation. So for example, if I go to Azure AD portal here and this app registrations and then I have got some let's go back here uh, here I have got some application and if we scroll down here we have got the manifest so this is where you can see this app role so we need to look at this app role setting in the manifest and then we need to update that so here we have got the app roles empty, but we can update that to include these information. So allowed member types, and then we have got the user, and then this is administrator role for product catalog. Then here we have got the viewer role for product catalog. So we can specify these things here. So these are roles for an application. So after defining the app roles within the apps manifest, you can now add users to the role. So from the enterprise application blade in the Azure AD admin center, we select the application and then we select the users and groups. And then that's where we can add. So here we can see we select these users and group and then we can add users and groups in here. So in ASP.NET, you can secure a controller so only authenticated users can access it uh, by decorating it with the method with authorized attribute. So this attribute also supports securing the endpoint based on the app role. So you can also use that authorized attribute to secure specific methods on the endpoint. For example, here in this code, we can see this will allow the product administrator um, ability to create new products on the products controller. Okay, that concludes our module two, implement Microsoft identity part two. So this module, we learn how we can create and secure custom APIs with Microsoft identity. We also learn how to call secure APIs from web apps and daemon apps. We learn role-based access control and how to leverage application roles in custom apps. We will now take a 10 minute break See you everyone back here in 10 minutes, then we'll finish part one by learning about how to work with Microsoft Graph.
Welcome back from break everyone. It's time to start module 3. So in this module we will learn how to optimize data usage with query parameters, optimize network traffic, access user data from Microsoft Graph, managing group lifecycle with Microsoft Graph, access files with Microsoft Graph and use change notifications to track changes with Microsoft Graph. So let's get started with module 3. So let's start with first lesson optimize data usage with query parameters. So Microsoft Graph it provides a unified programmability model that you can use to build apps for your organization and consumers that interact with data of millions of users. So the Microsoft Graph REST API implements many of the OData protocol query parameters. And in this section, we'll learn how to manipulate queries using these query parameters. So let's look at Microsoft Graph and the query parameters. So first, let's understand what is Microsoft Graph. So Microsoft Graph is a gateway to your data in Microsoft Cloud. As you can see from the list of resources and services and the entities here that we have got listed on this slide. So we have got data from Office 365. We have got data from Windows 10 and Enterprise Mobility and Security. So we go get all things like mail, calendar, contact stars, and then all these theme stuff, and also identity and management information. And then from the Azure AD admin units and the applications and the devices and the threat analytics and threat protections and so on. So Microsoft Graph is your single resource that proxies multiple Microsoft services. Because the graph acts as a proxy endpoint to multiple endpoints for each of the Microsoft service, it will simply it will simplify the process of obtaining OAuth access tokens that you must include with each request to one of these endpoints. So unlike the process of obtaining a different token for each endpoint, the Microsoft Graph, it enables you to obtain single access token to submit requests that can retrieve data from all the services and the endpoints the Microsoft Graph exposes. So one of the other challenges we used to have with these different services was determining the endpoint URL for each service as some were unique per user. Now to address this, Microsoft created a directory service that you could query to determine what the URL was for the different services. However, Microsoft Graph greatly simplifies this for you with two endpoints, which is me. So this is used as slash me and then my organization endpoint, which will take you to the root of your user entity and your organization in Microsoft Graph. What's nice about Microsoft Graph supporting both styles of authentication like Azure AD plus MSAs is that the same API and the endpoints can be used to create applications that will expose business data in Microsoft 365 or consumer data with Microsoft Consumer Services. So this makes it easy for you as a developer to learn a single API and have the ability to configure their application to support both business and consumer data that is driven strictly by the user and what type of account the user logs in with. As a developer, you can create all sorts of applications that will communicate with Microsoft Graph to support as many developers and platform as possible. So Microsoft Graph has got two options for developers to choose from when integrating with the graph into their applications. At its core, Microsoft Graph is a REST API, so you can make use of this. So this means that the developers can use any platform, any framework, or any programming language that they are most comfortable with. The only requirement is that they can use this common HTTP request and process HTTP responses. Second option you have is native SDK. So you can utilize the framework and platform specific implementations which is going to abstract the details of constructing and processing REST requests over HTTP. So you have got SDKs for .NET, iOS, Android, Ruby, and so on. 
So in this demo, we are going to look at how we can use the Graph Explorer to search for content. So for that, I need to go to my browser and I need to open up Graph Explorer. Now to access the Graph Explorer, you can go to this particular URL here, which is developer.microsoft.com gra slash graph slash graph explorer. And you can see here that we have got uh, graph.microsoft.com endpoint so you can see that endpoint here and this is calling the me endpoint and then here i have got version 1.0 okay there are two versions version 1.0 and beta version so i'm gonna run my queries against 1.0 when i click run query here it shows me this output. Now I'm not currently logged in, so it's gonna show me some sample data, okay? Now, if I want to see the data from my organization, then I wanna make sure that I sign in here, okay? So once I sign in, then it's going to show me my information. So let's click sign in. And then if I run the query again, and then now you can see it's bringing here information about me. So the logged in uses identity, okay? Now, if I want to look for certain, um, maybe specific person or specific thing, then I can enter here another query. So let me say I want people. So I'm going to say people and you'll see here that it brings up intelligence like it shows you what could be the next thing. So I want to let's say search and I'm going to do a search and here it brings the search option and I want maybe um, let's look for. So let's look for this one and run the query. So now it says that you need consent to the permissions. So now what I need to do, because I don't have the permissions, I am not really able to search for other users. So I need to go in here and I need to give myself the required permissions. Or what I could do is I can just sign out and I can run the demo on the demo data so let me sign out here and i'm gonna go to graph explorer again and let's run the search from here so i want people and then i'm gonna do dollar search let's look for something else so here I'm going to run this and you can see here that I if I look for this, then I'm getting this person whose last name matches with the search that we have got here. So this is how you could actually make use of search to see the specific content and expand the related entities in Microsoft Graph. Let's now look at how we can reduce the traffic with batched requests. Now, many complex scenarios can involve complex interactions with the data which is exposed via Microsoft Graph. For instance, consider an application needs to display three different types of data from Microsoft Graph. Now, the expand operator may not be sufficient as the data is not directly relatable or the queries would be too complex. Another scenario may involve multiple write operations like preparing for an event by saving resources to a shared OneDrive folder, creating a shared OneNote notebook for event and then sending meeting invites out to the participant. Now, applications can get quite chatty very quickly, which can also introduce potential throttling issues. So one way to avoid any issues and to introduce optimization is to group multiple requests into a single request to Microsoft Graph. 
so this support which is called as batching instructs microsoft graph to execute multiple requests and return the group results for each of the requests in single response there so batching it does not reduce the number of requests but it does reduce the number of http round trips your application requests to the microsoft graph in this demo we are going to look at how we can reduce traffic with batched requests so we are back here in the graph explorer now here what i want to do is first of all i'm going to sign in so let me go here and i want to sign in and then i'm going to modify my permissions so i'm going to go here and i'm going to say select permissions and then in the permissions i want to assign myself mail dot read permission so i'm going to select this and click consent so it signs me again now i have assigned myself the permission so i'm going to go close this one now i'm going to submit three get requests in a single batch so for that what i want to do is i need to first of all update this one now to call the batch you have to say dollar batch here and then we have to put the request body so whenever you are making a batch request call you need to have request body in the input and this is a json code and then that is what going to send three requests at a time so let me show what that code is so here i have got my request body and let me expand that to show what the code is so what we are doing is we have got this url so we are calling this me endpoint and we are selecting display name job title and user principal that's a get method and that's the first call second we are getting me dot messages and then we are filtering that by importance equal to high and then we are selecting the from and subject and receive time again this is a get request and then here we have got me dot event me slash events and that's another get request there okay so we need to make this call we have to make sure that we are making use of post query rather than get and then let's run this so i'm gonna run that and you can see here that it is bringing me the information so we have got different options here there are three responses so first this is id2 you can see the status 200 and then we have got the headers and then there is this body um, about that and then this is the id1 so here we have got the information about me and then id3 again here we have got the events now because i don't have much data in this tenant it's not showing a lot of information but the request was successful but there's no data so the value is empty but if there was data then it will show you all those details in here so that is how you can make use of that batch request now we can see how we can combine the post and the get request in the single batch now this one that we did it is all get so let's have a look at how we can combine the post and get request so i'm going to replace the request body with other requests here and let me expand this and we have got post so i'm calling this url which is me slash drive slash root slash children and then post and this is going to create a batch folder okay so test batch folder and then this one here is going to get that test batching folder okay so let's run this and this is again a post query and then let's query
So the query has been run and you can see the status 201. So 201 is whenever you are doing create or something and you get the positive response, successful response, then you get 201. So here we have that. And then if I scroll down, here is two. So that has got status 200. And then it brings up the information about that test batching folder. And if I go to my OneDrive, so what this is doing is it's creating the folder in my OneDrive, right? So here, if you see me.drive, so that's going to my OneDrive. So if I go there, then I will be able to actually see the folder. So let's go to office.com and I want to open my OneDrive. And then here you can see we have got the folder test batching folder. So this one we created with the help of these batch requests that we sent to Microsoft Graph, which created the folder and then got the metadata about the folder in the second request. So we used post call and then we also used get call in this batch request here. So this is how you can reduce traffic with batch request in Microsoft Graph. Let's now look at how we can optimize network traffic with Microsoft Graph. So in this section, you will learn how Microsoft Graph has implemented throttling to Microsoft Graph to limit the overviews of Microsoft Graph resources. You will learn how to avoid requests from being throttled and how to properly handle scenarios when Microsoft Graph throttles high user traffic in a graceful way. Let's talk about Microsoft Graph throttling. So Microsoft Graph is designed to handle a high volume of requests. If an overwhelming number of requests happen, my throttling helps maintain optimal performance and reliability of Microsoft Graph service. So throttling limits the number of concurrent calls to a service to prevent overviews of resources. Throttling limits vary based on the scenario. For example, if you're performing a large volume of writes, the possibility of throttling is higher than if you were only performing reads. So you may ask, what are the throttling limits per hour or per day? This is not an easy question to answer. Microsoft Graph is a proxy service that provides access to multiple Microsoft hosted services and endpoints. Now, each of these services has their own process or for calculating when requests would be throttled. In addition to different services, not all the requests are treated equally. So a read request is not as demanding on the service as a write request. Furthermore, not all read or write operations can be treated equally. A read request for an ID and the name of 50 groups is very different from including expand query operator to include ID, name, email, phone number for all the members of these groups. So in this demo, we are going to look at throttling in Microsoft Graph. So here I have got a console application that I have already created and I have got an application registered in Azure AD. So we are going to make use of this console application. First of all, in this application, I have got this authentication handler. So this is the helper which helps with the authentication. And then I have got this MCL authentication handler. Okay, so here I have go, got code to acquire the token by username and password. And then I have got here um, program.cs. So in this program.cs, I am going to make call to this endpoint, okay, in Microsoft Graph. And then this call, if the uh, requests get throttled, then there is um, some error it's going to show and it's going to show X okay, on the console. So it's going to write either dot 
or it's going to write X depending on whether the request is successful or whether the request is throttled. So let's see here if um, if we have got So in this particular function, we have got the app setting. So we are taking the application ID and the tenant ID. And then here we have got create authorization provider. So we are actually creating the auth provider. We have got the scopes here, user.read and mail.read. And then we create the authentication provider. We read the password and then we read the username. So that's what the application is all about. So let's run this and we'll see how we can see the throttling. So let me run that. So dot net run. And this is going to prompt me for username password. So let me get my username password. So here now you can see in the output we have got some dots and we have got some x's so x is when there was a failure so for the failed request it's going to write x and for the successful request it's going to write dot here so you can see here that some of the requests fail and they fail because of the throttling because we are actually sending these a lot of requests in loop here so if i scroll up let me go up here and you can see here that we have got this loop and then in that loop the requests are going so if the request gets throttled then we get the x and we have got that x written in here so that's how you can see whether you are getting fail response now you also you can um, notice the code so here you can see failed response code too many requests so that means that you got the 429 and it has throttled the microsoft graft has throttled your request so um, you can also see here there is a retry after so this is the header and this value is in seconds so microsoft graph tells you to wait before sending the next request to avoid being further throttled in here so this is how you can work with microsoft graph to understand where the throttling is happening and then work your code according to what's required to make it successful rather than being throttled let's now look at how we can access user data from Microsoft Graph. So users are the core of most operations in Microsoft 365. So Microsoft Graph, it enables developers full control over the life cycle of users in Microsoft 365, including creating, updating, and deleting your users and to listening, listing the users in the organization so in this section we'll learn how we can use microsoft graph to work with users in microsoft 365 including the required permissions so let's start with working with users in the organization the user resource is a gateway to resources related to the user the user can be the currently signed in user or another user if your identity and application has been granted the necessary permissions now what kind of things can you do with the microsoft graph user resource you can do things like manage your organization so create new users in your organization or update the resources and relationships for existing users work with calendars and tasks so you can view query and update the user calendar and the calendar groups associated with the user or administer email and handle contacts or enrich your app with user insights so all these things you can do with the microsoft graph in this demo we are going to look at how we can work with users in the organization so for that i have got an application so i'm going to go to azure active directory go into app registrations and open up my application here so this is my application graph console app and for this application i have set up authentication here so this is my 
authentication native client because I am going to make use of this in a desktop application. So I have got the mobile and desktop applications added and I have got this URL that I have added here. And this is a single tenant application and I have also enabled public flows here. So this is used by the desktop application. So I need to turn this on and say yes in here to allow the public client flows. So that's my application I have got created and then I have got a console application. So let me open my Visual Studio code and you can see here I have got my console application. Now in this console application, I am making use of Microsoft Identity. I am also making use of Microsoft Graph and then here I have got Microsoft.Extensions.Configuration. So I have got all that and I have got my application details in the application settings. So tenant ID and the application ID. And then I have got here some helper class. So Microsoft authentication provider. So MCL authentication provider. And I am going to make use of acquire token by username and password just like the earlier demo here. Okay. So I have got that code for that. Now what I need to do in this particular application is I'm going to make calls to Microsoft Graph through this application here. So you can see here once I log in, then I have got this request for Microsoft Graph. So here request all the users. So this is going to request all the users. So let's run this and then we'll see the output of this application. So let me start my command prompt and then here I'm going to first run .NET build. And then I'm going to run .NET, so .NET run. And then I need to enter my username and password. So let me get that. So now this has made a call to Microsoft Graph and the call that we made was about all the users. So request all the users. So here we are getting the users and it says client.users.request. So that's what we are actually calling. Okay. And then it writes down. So for each of the user, it's writing down all the details. So these are all the users that I have got in my tenant. So next, what we are going to do, we are going to display the currently signed in users details here. So let me comment this bit. So I'm going to comment this and I'm going to uncomment this part here. Okay, so what this is going to do is it's going to look for the signed in user. So when you say client.me.request, you're actually looking for that signed in user in here. So let's run this again and let me make it maximum. So .NET run. And here we have got .NET run. I need to again enter my user. So let me click that. Enter. I'm going to get my password. And I'm going to click enter. And then you can see here that it's giving me the details. So this is my email address and then this is the object ID and this is my name. So it gives the details of the signed in user here. Next, we are going to do another query. So let's comment this. And I'm going to uncomment this section here. So here what we are doing, we are actually then looking for Megan. So client.users, we want to look for Megan here and get the information about 
user making so let's run this and see what we get so actually let me save and let's run it again let's enter the username and password and then here you can see we have got the request for making and you can see this was the request that was made so for this third call what we did we called for user information megan so here client.users and we gave the users upn and then dot request so that brings up the users details and then we write those in this console and here this is the call that was made so you can actually write down the call as well so we did three examples here first of all in the first one we have all the users so here we request client.users.request so request all the users which is going to show all these users and then in the second one what we did here is client.me.request so this is the logged in user so we can see the logged in user and then in the third one client.users and give a specific user where we saw information of megan in here so this is how you can make use of Microsoft Graph to work with the users in your organization. Let's look at user profiles and related users now. So profile photos, they can be set on user accounts, groups and contacts in Office 365. So you as a developer can use Microsoft Graph to view, download and manage profile photos for these three types of resources. So your user, your groups and your contacts. Photos, they are stored as binary data that you can convert to different formats for different scenarios. For example, Base64 for your web environment. To access the photo, to get the photo, you can use slash photo dollar value endpoint on that resource, which is going to return the metadata and the binary data of the photo. And you can do the same operation using the graph SDK. So here we are calling this graph.me.photo.request and then we are getting that information. Now let's look at how we can modify users. So when creating or updating a user, HTTP request body contains the property values for the user. So this is typically submitted as a JSON object in string form. So when creating a user, you need to specify the required properties for a user at the minimum, and you can optionally specify any other writable properties. So here we can see the properties which are required. So these are the minimum ones. And then here you can see the request there. So we are calling this and we are doing a post and then we are adding this information here. The groups are collections of users who share access to resources in Microsoft services or in your apps. So developers can use Microsoft Graph to create and manage different types of groups. Now in this section, we learn how to manage life cycle of groups and the different types of groups and obtain information about the users associated with the group using Microsoft Graph. So let's look at how we can manage group life cycle with Microsoft Graph. So working with groups in the organization. So Microsoft Graph enables developers to work with groups in Microsoft 365. So groups are collections of users and other principles that share access to resources in Microsoft services or your app. So using Microsoft Graph, developers can view and manage the groups within Microsoft 365. So here we have got Office 365 groups and also security group. So there are two types of groups. Office 365, which are used for collaboration. So they have got a team and then a SharePoint site. And then we have got all the other collaboration features with there, also known as the unified group. And then security groups, which are used to control access to resources. So they can combine Office 365 groups and other security groups. Now let's look at users and their groups.
Unlike the previous example, the member of property returns a collection of directory objects that the user is direct member of. Now, these are groups that the user has been explicitly added to. Microsoft Graph can also return the list of directory objects a user is transitive member of. So these are the groups that user hasn't been directly added to but is a member of through nested security group. So this can happen if a user is in a security group that's been added to another security group or is a member of a group with dynamic membership. So you can use this member of property which returns the groups the user is directly member of and you can use get member groups property which returns the group the user is transitive members of. Let's now look at how we can manage the group life cycle. To create new groups, you can use HTTP posts and you can call this particular endpoint. You need to pass on these minimal properties and you can specify the new group as Office 365 group by specifying the group type as unified and then you'll be able to create the Office 365 group. And here in this code, we are doing the same thing by using SDK. To delete a group, you will submit HTTP delete request. So here we are deleting this particular group or when you're doing through SDK, we need the ID and then we say delete async in here. So let's look at how we can access files with Microsoft Graph. So OneDrive is the files hub for Office 365. So OneDrive enables users to access and collaborate on files no matter where they are stored. So Microsoft Graph enables developers to use a single API to work with the files in OneDrive. So files in Office 365, they are shared, stored in Drive. So users can store files in personal drive, their OneDrive or in a shared drive, which is powered by SharePoint document library. So in this section, we'll learn how we can access files in OneDrive, both reading and writing files and how to traverse relationships between files and users. So let's look at access and download files from OneDrive. First of all, why do we really integrate with OneDrive file storage in the cloud? So integrating with OneDrive file storage helps you to tap into billions of files. OneDrive users can access their files from any device, online, offline, and share files with people inside and outside the organization. So OneDrive enables real-time co-authoring in familiar apps like your Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. And files light up with rich thumbnails for hundreds of formats, video, streaming, analytics, and more. This is all powered by Microsoft Graph. So data in OneDrive is protected and it with advanced encryption, compliance, and security features that customers trust. So this app that you are creating can make use of the OneDrive to store the file, or maybe if user wants to share the file, work with the content in the different formats your app understands, or work with file content and metadata without downloading the binary, or you can react to file changes if someone uploads the file, updates the file, you want to do some action or those kind of things. So let's explore Microsoft Graph files related resource endpoints. So we have got two resources here, Drive and Drive item. So Drive represents the logical container of files like a document library or uses OneDrive. Drive item represents an item within the drive, like a document or a photo or video or a folder. So these two resources expose data in different ways. So there's property, so ID and name, you have got facets, so file, photo, um, or the presence of facet like file or folder indicate behaviors and properties of the drive item. You've got references like children and thumbnails, so point to other resource collections. So Microsoft Graph also enables the sign-in user to access another user's OneDrive, provided they have been granted access to using it. So using the Graph endpoint, 
um, you can get access to that other users OneDrive. So here, for example, you can say user slash user ID and then you say slash drive. So you're getting access to a user whose user ID has been specified here and their OneDrive. Accessing files in Office 365 group. So you can get the group ID and then you can access the drive. So you're getting files in Office 365 groups. If you want to get access to files in SharePoint Online site collection, then you can go to sites, site ID, and then drive, which is going to give you access to the document library and then get the files from there. Now let's look at how we can upload the files to OneDrive. Microsoft Graph supports uploading files up to 4 MB in size using simple HTTP put request. To upload files, submit the HTTP put to the collection where new file should be created. The request URL must include the name of the file to create and um, end with the content endpoint. So this here is a small file you can see. Um, the request must include HTTP request header content type with the value that matches the type of the file that is uploaded. So here we can see the type of the file. For example, to upload a text file to currently signed in users root OneDrive account, you can use requests like this. So here this is users root OneDrive and here also we are doing the same thing. We have got the file name in here and then we can add that small file there. If you want to upload large files, so greater than 4 MB. So Microsoft Graph also supports uploading larger files, so larger than 4 MB up to maximum size of what is supported by the OneDrive. The support for larger file also enables you to resume a transfer in scenario where upload was interrupted or paused. So uploading a large file, it involves creating an upload session followed by up uploading the bytes to the session. Okay, so here we create the upload session and then we'll be uh, sending the file information. Let's now look at how we can work with file relationships and trends in OneDrive. Insights are relationships calculated using advanced analytics and machine learning techniques. Using Microsoft Graph, you can identify OneDrive documents trending around your users. So insights are returned using different API. So you have got the trending option, which returns the documents from OneDrive and from SharePoint sites trending around the user. You can you get the used endpoint. So use endpoint returns the documents viewed and modified by the user, includes the document the user used in OneDrive for business, SharePoint, and opened as email attachments. And then you have got the shared. So the shared endpoint returns documents which are shared with the user. So documents can be shared as email attachments or as OneDrive for business links sent in emails. So each insight is returned with a resource visualization, which includes properties for displaying the results and a resource reference, which includes the details on the return record. Okay, so let's now look at use change notifications and track changes with Microsoft Graph. So Microsoft Graph enables developers to consume user information stored in Microsoft 365 in custom application. The data retrieved from the graph through REST API or using one of the SDKs. Now, in this section, we'll learn how to work with change notifications, which are webhooks and track changes, which is a Delta query in Microsoft Graph. First, let's understand Microsoft Graph change notification. Change notifications enable applications to be alerted when data changes or is created in Microsoft Graph. So when the wanted entity is created, updated or deleted, Microsoft Graph submits post, HTTP posts to a specified endpoint. Your custom endpoint listens for these messages and then acts on them based on the logic which is defined by your 
business requirements. So you get notifications on messages, events, contacts, groups, and um, all the services that you have got available in Microsoft 365. Some of the example notification scenarios, you want to maybe translate an email when it arrives or start a new flow when a document is um, some number of months old or create a new user account in your application when the user joins an organization. So to develop change notification, you first need to create an app that will host a web API to listen for notifications. This will be the component that won't only trigger the request to create the subscription, but it will also manage subscription renewals and receive and respond to notifications received from Microsoft Graph. So you need to create a subscription to tell Microsoft Graph what entities you want to receive notifications about and the address of your web API where it will post them. Your application is notified of this activity once this subscription is created. Now, you as a developer must renew subscriptions for notification as needed as all subscriptions have got an expiration time associated with them. If the subscription isn't renewed, it will be eventually expired. Now, you will have to keep track of the subscriptions and then make sure that you renew. The development experience for creating an app that receives change notifications can be challenging because you do have to stand up a well-known and accessible HTTP secure endpoint to receive notification. You can use ng-rock if you want to simplify your local um, development. This will help you to redirect the notification to your dev environments. Let's now look at Microsoft Graph change notifications. Okay, so you first need to create an app that will host the web app to listen for notifications. So this will be the component that won't only trigger the request to create subscription, but it will also manage the subscription renewals and receive and respond to notifications which are received from Microsoft Graph. Your application is notified of this activity by creating a subscription with Microsoft Graph. The subscription tells Microsoft Graph what entities you want to receive notifications about and the address of your web API to post them. And then you'll have to renew your subscriptions for notifications as needed as all the subscriptions have an expiration time associated with them. If the subscription isn't renewed, it